Okay, so what I want to do today is to give you a different spin on the collapse conjecture. I want to show you some intimate relationships it has with some fractals and some complex networks. And ultimately, what I want to convince you of is that the collapse conjecture is not an exceptionally hard problem. I mean, it is a very hard problem, but there are loads and loads of other problems which are incredibly similar to the collapse problem, which I imagine are equally, if not more, difficult. So let's go. go. What is the collapse conjecture? Well, let's say we have a positive integer n. That is a positive whole number. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to change n into something I'm going to call f of n. What is f of n? Well, it's some thing which depends upon n. More precisely, f of n is going to be equal to n divided by 2 if n is even. You know, if it's like 2, 4, 6, 8, whatever. And otherwise, f of n is going to be equal to 3n plus 1. Let's have a look at how this works in practice. Suppose we start with the initial condition n equals 6. And we're just going to repeatedly update it. Uh, according to this operator. So we start with 6 and then 6 is even, so we divide it by 2, we get 3. 3 is odd, so we times it by 3 and add 1, we get 10. 10 is even, so we divide it by 2, getting 5, which is odd, so we times it by 3 and add 1. It's 16, which is even, so we divide it by 2. 8, we divide that by 2. 4, and we divide that by 2. 2, and we divide that by 2, we get 1. And then what happens? Well, 1 is odd, so we times it by 3 and add 1. So we get back to 4. And then when we update 4, we go to 2 to 1, to 4, to 2, to 1, to 4, to 2, to 1, to 4, for the rest of eternity. So in this case here, we started with the number 6. It grew a little bit, it shrunk a little bit, a lot of interesting things happened, and then eventually we ended up getting trapped in this cycle here, where the number just kept changing cyclically. What the collapse conjecture says is that if you start with any integer at all, and you keep updating it like this, eventually the number one is going to appear. So let's let's write that down. That's the big problem which has defeated the world's greatest minds for decades. So starting with any positive integer n if you keep updating it that means applying this update operation f you eventually get 1 Okay then, so here it is. This is the collapse conjecture. Good luck. Now, for those exploring souls amongst you, if you want to start to understand about this problem, I, I think the easiest way is to just start plugging in some numbers and see what happens. An interesting case, if you have got 10 minutes to spare,
is to check out what happens when you start with n equals 27. Now, all of the numbers up to, well, I don't know, the first few millions or billions or whatever have been verified to satisfy the collapse conjecture. Relatively recently, there's been some quite interesting alternative ways of thinking about the collapse conjecture. For example, Leverman, Schleicher and Wood had the very interesting idea of lifting the collapse conjecture, which is a problem about whole numbers and number theory, essentially. They had the idea of lifting that into a problem on the complex plane. OK, so I know not everyone knows about complex numbers and complex planes. So I'll give you a 20 second primer about what they are. Basically, the real numbers, you can think of those as going from left to right. To, um, and then the y axis represents what we call imaginary numbers. What are imaginary numbers? Well, one is the unit's real number, the unit's imaginary number is the square root of minus one. So just in case you thought that negative numbers don't have square roots, it's not entirely true. They do have square roots, but those square roots are imaginary. And it makes sense to think of them in a kind of perpendicular direction to our real numbers. And so we get a plane and we call it the complex plane. Okay then, so in this particular case, um, we have this picture on the complex plane of lots of interesting kind of fractally pictures. But you might ask, what on earth does this have to do with the Collatz conjecture? Well, if you know about Mandelbrot sets and Julia sets, then again, you probably will already be quite familiar with some of these concepts. But anyway, for those of you who are not, let me explain. You see this complicated looking function here at the top. Well, this function turns out to actually basically be the same as the function which I was using before to update the collapse process. In other words, if you put an even positive integer in here, then you get half of that as the answer. And if you put an odd positive integer in here, then you get three times that plus one as the answer. So essentially this is kind of like an extended version. You can think of this as an extension of our collapse updating function to the complex plane. So it doesn't just work on integers, it doesn't just work on real numbers, it also works on these complex numbers, which um, you get by adding together some real and imaginary bits. And um, so what does this lovely fractal represent then? Well, this fractal essentially represents which pieces of the um, which pieces of the complex plane stay small when you keep applying this function, and which pieces of the complex plane go big. So, in particular, these black regions. These are places where if you apply the updating function, you end up you end up getting these numbers which stay close to where you started from. They don't get big. But if you repeatedly apply the update operator here to something outside of these black regions, then the number becomes bigger and bigger and bigger every time you update it. And very quickly, the answer you have is way off 
either over there or over there or over there. And its absolute value will go to infinity. So essentially what this picture is showing you is which parts of a complex plane stay close when you keep updating them under this, under this function, and which parts of a complex plane go miles away. I like to think of the collapse conjecture in a much simpler way, and that is involving networks. So the idea is basically that every node represents a number, and we shall put an arrow from one number to another when we can generate the latter by applying the collapse update operator to the former. So, for example, we should put an arrow from 6 to 3, because when we do the collapse update on 6, 6 is even, so we divide it by 2 and we get 3. Similarly, we put an arrow from 3 to 10, because... When we do the collapse update on 3, 3 is odd, so we times it by 3 and add 1, and we get 10. And so we make this network which represents all the different updates between these different numbers. And essentially, this is like looking at the collapse problem from a helicopter. We can see all of the action going on between all the different players, at least, up until the first 50 numbers or so. And what we see, sort of predictably, is that all of the numbers eventually get sucked into this kind of cycle here. Okay then, so we can look at some larger networks. This one here is just for the first few nodes, but this picture here is for the first 500, and you can see that it's a lot more elaborate. Mm. Of course, the collapse conjecture still holds, and all of these directed paths all eventually end up going to node number one. But you can see that this network that's been produced here is really elaborate. Okay, so here's how I prefer to think about the collapse conjecture as a network. We take all the integers up to, say, 64 or whatever, and we think of each integer as a node, and we point two arrows out of each integer. We point a red arrow out of it, which points to the number which is equal to three times that thing, plus one. And we also, and so that's the red edge which points out of a node, for example, the red edge pointing out of 4 points towards 13, because 13 equals 3 times 4 plus 1. And then we also have a blue edge pointing out of each vertex, which points to the thing which you get by doubling the number of that vertex slash node. So this is a way of representing the collapse conjecture. It's not quite so straightforward as before. Um, so we can reformulate our collapse conjecture in terms of this network as follows. The collapse conjecture is equivalent to the statement, if you generate a network like this for the first however many nodes you like, say a billion nodes, a trillion nodes, or however many you like, and then you pick any point, then if you always go backwards along a red edge, whenever there's a red edge pointing into the, your current location, and otherwise you go forwards along a blue edge, then you will eventually get to node number one. Why is that formulation equivalent? Well, if a node is even, then it will have a blue edge pointing into it. And in that case, if you're following the collapse rule, you ought to backtrack along that blue edge. And otherwise, um, your node is not even, so you should go along the red edge, which represents multiplying by 3 and adding 1. Okay, so it sounds more elaborate, but 
there's some cool things about this. Um, one cool thing is that these networks are really, really easy to generate. And also, we can see that this collapse kind of problem is related to something else, which I'm not sure much attention has been given to. But it's the idea of a kind of double-valued mapping. So mathematics has a lot to say, and there's been a lot of attention on mappings where every number gets sent to a number. But in this case, we're thinking about mappings where every number gets sent to two different numbers, 2x and 3x plus 1. And so what kinds of properties do systems like that have? And so then it begs the question, what happens if you change these equations? 1 plus 3x and 2x are very simple equations. But let's change the parameters a little bit. Let's see what other kinds of networks we get. Yeah. OK, so here's a different system. Now the red edges represent the operation x plus 1. So simply a red arrow points from a number to that number plus 1. And again, the blue edges represent multiplication by 2. And so here, immediately, just by tinkering with the parameters a little bit, we're starting to see some fairly interesting things happening. I mean, the fact that the Mathematica graph plotting mechanism has naturally arranged these nodes in a kind of spiral shape is no coincidence. I mean, it turns out that one can see the kind of way this, that this addition operation and this multiplication by two operation work together to naturally produce this kind of spiral shape. OK, so here's another fairly interesting structure, which is produced by a similar sort of operation. Now the red edges represent the operation 2 plus 2x. So, for example, 6 is linked to 14 because 6 times 2 plus 2 is 14. And again, the blue edges represent multiplying by 2. OK, so the collapse conjecture is often known as the 3n plus 1 problem. So I suppose this could be called the 3n plus 2 problem because our blue edges still represent multiplying or division by 2, if you like, if you go along them backwards. Whereas, in this case, the red edges instead represent multiplying by 3 and adding 2. So, in the collapse problem, when a number's odd, you times it by 3 and add 1. The only difference here is that for odd numbers, we multiply them by 3 and add 2. And you can see once again um, that it's producing a rather intricate looking network. So it seems like this is a kind of ingredient for complexity to have like multiplying by three and then adding something for one operation and the other operation being multiplication by two or halving if you're taking it backwards. Anyway, don't take my word for it. Let's iterate this system for longer and see if the network it generates is complicated or simple. OK, so here's the network we get when we look at our, say, 3n plus 2 problem that I was just talking about. Um, but we're looking at it now for the first 1,000 numbers. And you can see that the network being produced is remarkably elaborate. Here, the red edges represent multiplying by 2 and adding 1. And the blue edges represent multiplying by 3. So we've kind of changed things around now. Um, but you can see that still the consequence is a very, very interesting kind of network. Does this also produce something complicated? Or is there some kind of pattern which emerges when we look at it on a larger scale? Well, let's have a look at what happens if we... Let's have a look at what happens over the first 1,000 nodes. 
Well, here it is. It's another complex network, all right.